From the campus of Yale University, this is Business Talk with Jim Campbell, nationally syndicated across the country on the Biz Talk radio network and coming to you from our flagship stations, Yale Radio, WYBC, and 1490 AM, WGCH, Greenwich. All talk and all business, 60 minutes of radio with leading figures from the world of business along with the business of politics and sports. Inside the failure of the post-war period in Iraq with an Iraqi American from the Shiite side of the conflict in Iraq. Today on Business Talk with Jim Campbell, Kanan Makia was born in Baghdad. He's the author of the best-selling Republic of Fear about Iraq. He is the Sylvia K. Hassenfeld Professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies at Brandeis University now. And Kanan's new book, Just Out, The Rope, a novel. Welcome, Kanan. How are you? Very well, thanks. Thank you for inviting me, Jim. Honored to have you. The book, as I had told you before, I read in one sitting. It's gut-wrenching, kind of tragic, but mesmerizing. And I'm particularly uh, looking forward to this because obviously you bring a perspective from the U.S., from Iraq, and from the Shiite side within Iraq. So one of the things that struck me, a sort of a fundamental insight, you assign fundamental failure to that post-war period to the Shiite side, not necessarily the U.S., which is, of course, what we think over here. So go ahead and uh, give us your sense on that. Well, if you look at it in historical terms, uh, of course, 2003 was a major, the 2003 war was a major watershed event in the Middle East as a whole. But if you look at it from the Iraqi side, uh, you know, it was a watershed event in which, and you, and you ask yourself, why did it go so wrong? That's the question uh, one I, I, you know, I ask in the book. I mean, there are, of course, the obvious things that the United States did wrong, and much has been written about that. Very many volumes have appeared. But I think by far the greater failure, that's the contention of the book, is the failure of the elite empowered by the United States. Uh, in the United States toppled a, a regime and essentially began the process of constructing a new one. But it was a very hands-off type of uh, engagement. And that empowered, newly empowered uh, elite uh, over a dominant, predominantly Shiite by conscious decision on the part of the United States. In other words, the United States was perfectly aware and self-consciously about to 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 uh, to to empower uh, the Shiites in Iraq for the first time in their thousand-year history. This is a very big thing, uh, and uh, it is that elite, therefore, that carries the greatest burden for uh, what happened. And the book attempts to work its way through the very many different levels of that argument. It's not just an argument. I mean, it, it, they had the power and. It was it was uh, power to that it, the success would have fallen to them, and failure also has to be attributed to them. So my book is about that failure. Very interesting. Um, right on up to uh, uh, Maliki, uh, the prime minister at the end. You assign him, um, you know, a, a, a strong responsibility for that. And the second part of that question is: Is there a post-war plan that could have worked? Yes. Again, it's not about a plan made in the United States, so to speak, beforehand that would have worked. I mean, politics is full of the unpredictable. It's in the very nature of the beast. If you take a society as abused as Iraq for 30 years, and then you knock down the walls of the prison camp that essentially Iraq represented, and you take out the local tyrant and all his goons standing guard around the gate, and then you say, okay, now build yourself a new society, which is essentially what the United States did. There was no real planning in that sense. And the United States did not administer. It, it had an army. It dealt with certain problems here and there. It made uh, passed laws for nine months, seven months. But then it very quickly empowered an Iraqi administration in July 2004. The country was politically independent. There was still a large American force. But for all practical purposes, Iraqi politicians were making all the key decisions within seven, eight, nine months of the war. So when you look at those decisions and you look at how they operated and you look at the state that the country is in now, the fundamental failure is there uh, because of the way they handled themselves. At moments like this, I mean, you know, if you have a Nelson Mandela, a man who can stand above the fray, he can have an overpowering influence because leadership begins to be about the ability to draw in people into the new enterprise. Remember, everything is new. It's a new beginning, starting from scratch, so to speak. Uh, and, uh, and we did not have anyone of that stature. On the contrary, 
It turned out the Shiites, who, of course, were uh, had suffered, uh, they carried the history of that suffering in their culture for very many years. They see themselves as victims. I mean, the culture, Shiite culture, uh, in a sense, glorifies, glorifies victimhood. And so th- the question is, to be a leader, to run a state, you, th- the question immediately becomes, can you rise above that victimhood, that sense of yourself as a victim? They couldn't. Or rather, they didn't. And I'm talking about the elite here, not the mass of the population. They needed to, uh, just as Mandela did, succeed, succeeded in doing, they needed to in order to pull the country together. Interesting, because uh, if anything, you know, the criticism of us being an occupation country, you're saying we almost turned it over uh, too quickly. Let me ask you this uh, question yes. now, that, uh, you know, after World War I, uh, it's been claimed Churchill built Iraq almost on a napkin, and that, you know, and Vice President Biden has recently, as you know, right after the war said the Shia, Sunni, and Kurds should be almost separate countries. The other hand, you say in the book that Iraq's no more sectarian than U.S. racism in parts of our country. How do you come down on whether the country should be splintered irreparably or, or not? You see, the, the partition that you talk about was way back at the time of the World War One. That was an awfully long time ago. And much of the world is constructed of com- countries in Latin America and Africa and Asia, which were cobbled together just as you described in one form or another by one imperial administration or another. So the, 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 it's, not, it's not how it was originally formed. It's, it's what, what happened to the idea of it. You take Brazil. I mean, Brazil has a strong Brazilian identity. It's got borders, it's got, which were uh, relatively new. Most countries are like that. Iraq, too. The question is, why did the idea of Iraq fall apart as it has fallen apart today? That's one of the themes of the book. How did the very notion, the concept, the sense of identity that was has with something called Iraq fall apart? And that, that's the question I'm grappling with, and I'm saying it's primarily the uh, emerging elite that chose to abandon that idea in favor of, of other sectarian ideas that today dominate the political scene. Uh, my, my, I, I, my take is this. Um, you know, it, it is very easy to, again, think on a blackboard in advance and on a piece of paper, redraw Iraq along what one might think are more natural, organic lines, the Kurds in one area, the Sunnis in another area, in another. But life is never that compartmentalized and that simple. It's very complicated. You have to take just one question. There are a million Kurds in Baghdad. I mean, that's a million Kurds. That's an awful lot. Sunnis and Shiites are deeply intermarried. 20% uh, or so of Shiites are intermarried with Sunni families. The same Arab tribes, some of them settled and became Shiites. The very same tribes, others stayed Sunni and and remained nomadic. So it's like a marriage that is very, very hard to uh, achieve a divorce in. Uh, and so I, it, it's likely to be a very bloody business dividing the country up again. Uh, and and uh, it seems to me that uh, it's almost as artificial as the country was, you know, as, it, as the way the country was cobbled together 80 years ago. It, it seems to me far less costly in human terms to to try to make the idea of the country work again rather than try to cut it apart. Yeah, but by the way, that which we is true of Iraq, which we're talking about. Iraq is now true of the whole Middle East. So it's no longer an Iraqi problem alone. It's a Syrian problem, a Libyan problem, a Yemeni problem. This, it turns out, was not just a problem in Iraq. It turns out it was one of the Middle East. And there's a connection between that 2003 war and that Arab Spring that followed it. The the fall of the first dictator is not unrelated to the fall of a whole slew of other dictators starting in 2011. That's interesting, because that's right. I'll, I'll, I'll link right to that. Uh, we got no SOFA agreement, status of force agreement, and President Obama almost did pre-announce a withdrawal date, and some have said that's led to a vacuum, that's led to ISIS, that's led to the destabilization of the Middle East. Donald Trump says we'd be better off if we'd left Saddam there. He was the smaller devil. We might have more electricity right after the war. Mm-hmm. Where, do you, where do you come down on that? I think there should have been a standing American force. That was a, a lost opportunity, frankly. And perhaps the growth of some of the worst abuses that happened, for instance, the fall of Muslim and, and chunks of Western Iraq, might not have happened had there been a residual force of five to 10,000 American troops left behind. It certainly would have curbed Iranian influence in Iraq. So I think that was a very hasty uh, decision and uh, in the long run will be viewed as a mistake. 
Um, but uh, but uh, so you know, I don't think the ty- the tyrant could have been left in. I mean, I don't think a. I don't think it's a moral. Uh, it's morally tenable. Uh, this is no, you know, ordinary run of the mill third world tyrant, Saddam Hussein. I mean, we have to remember he initiated three wars. He destabilized the whole region. He uh, committed genocide against the Kurds. I mean, I could go on and on. And we're talking, even by the low standards of the Middle East, a truly horrendous uh, type of dictator. We'll leave it at that for right now because we'll be right back. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell on the Business Talk Radio Network. Over 350 stations. We'll talk about the rope and novel as soon as we get back. We're back with Brandeis, professor of Islamic and Middle Eastern Studies, Kanan Makia. And uh, the, the novel, The Rope, begins and ends uh, with the execution of Saddam. And through this voice of an unnamed narrator, a narrator, I don't know if it's meant to sound like you or, or not, you talk about how it changed your life. You talk about how it was on a day of Sunni celebration, which is uh, really sort of almost, you could say, uncivilized uh, uh, to do it at that time. So I want to get your sense on that, why you started the novel on that, your points, and also that uh, his last words were, Palestine is Arab. What does that mean exactly? This actually factually happened. It's a, it's a novel, but uh, that, that particular phrase he said when he was up there on the scaffold with the rope around his neck uh, was something he actually shouted out. Well, these are the classic slogans of the Ba'ath Party, the party to which Saddam Hussein belonged and was the essentially the creator of inside Iraq and the leader of for 30 years. Uh, he, he, Palestine is Arab is a deep Arab nationalist belief that... Uh, that uh, the land known as Palestine is a part of the Arab world, and uh, we should never, ever forget it. And that's what Saddam was telling uh, the crowd, the jeering crowd of the mob that was, uh, you know, was baying for his blood, so to speak. Um, And he just defiantly shouted out those words. So I I make a play in the novel. I try to study what what he might have meant by those words, uh, using the narrator's uh, voice uh, to, to do that. Um, uh, and, yeah, and the narr- that's just a little thing. The narrator is not myself. The narrator is a young Shiite militiaman whose job it is to escort Saddam to the scaffold and who stands and witnesses the execution itself. So he is typical of the young generation that, so to speak, emerged into politics and had their first ever political experiences post-2003. Uh, the story, ultimately, just betrayal on every possible level you can go. Um, and it takes place in Dejaf, a Shia uh, homeland, which I guess stands for City of the Dead. Uh, talk about the novel. And Well, uh, so, so, so the novel uh, unfolds um, around two central events. It's framed around two central events. The first is the hanging, because Saddam, although he, it begins with him dying, uh, the rope is a reference, incidentally, to the actual rope that uh, 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 upon which he was hanged, which has a sort of a particular story attached to it that I talk about in the novel. And it ends with Saddam in the cell, who, uh, in a kind of completely fictional exercise, where I have him doing something like the Grand Inquisitor in Dostoevsky's uh, Brothers Karamazov. He starts to, to he becomes the uh, he, uh, the he explains why he himself and all the and all his reign of cruelty is necessary for a population like Iraq. And he sits there telling his, the narrator, who is listening to this, this young Shiite militiaman I mentioned earlier, that he is the logical culmination of Arab Muslim history, as he sees himself. This is, of course, the great dictator speaking and explaining. And then he looks at these small men, these gray men, as he calls them, these new leaders of Iraq installed by American tanks and American power, who didn't even weren't even able to bring him down themselves, and he he measures uh, he, he contrasts uh, the great distance that separates a great leader as he sees himself, of course, from them. And his words I use as a kind of mirror of the failure of the new elite. So it's it's uh, and and the, the moral behind that part of the tale is that. Saddam's legacy, that is the legacy of 30 years of his dictatorship, weighs very, very heavy on Iraq today. You, and the failure that we see is very much an inability to overcome that legacy. 
I talked of 2003 as a new beginning. It's a new beginning, in, of course, in the sense that the elite that was coming in is completely new. But it's not a new beginning in that men's memories and habits and uh, characters have been formed by 30 years of abuse. And it turns out that you know victims, when they get put in power, may not always be able to shed their victimhood. Victimhood is a terrible, terrible condition that uh, actually is a debilitating condition. And so part of this book is to show how victims turn into victimizers, and victimizers turn into victims, and it's, an, it's kind of an endless cycle. Uh, you know, we know children who have used become abusers first. It's not so different in politics, uh, especially politics, societies that have been subjected to decades of abuse. And and the politics of victimhood, uh, I coined that phrase, is a politics of, of, of competition over who has suffered the most. And you look at Iraqi politics and try to reduce it to its basics. You could say that's what it is. Uh, Shiites talking about their past victimhood and, and insisting they be compensated for it, and Sunnis and Kurds, everybody correctly talking about their victimhood. But unless you rise above that, it's a, it's a zero-sum game, and the result is only disaster. Leadership is about something bigger. It's about reaching out. It's about being able to convince people of, a, of, a, of, a, of certain new ethical principles in politics, of a basis of new identity, one in which victimhood is not the central be-all and end-all of politics. That is what this elite failed to do in Iraq. And from from our side of the uh, ocean over here in the U.S., uh, it's hard to get a grasp on uh, the level of split even within the Shiites that you talk about. And I don't know if this is all um, nonfiction, but the House of Seder, the House of Hakim, there's another house you talk about, 268 yes. militias. Um, You're right. Let us know about that. And, and, and the son of the Grand Ayatollah who was murdered, that's, that's factual too, right? That's true, yes. Sayyid Majid al Khoui, he returned uh, to Iraq. Uh, he was part of the Iraqi opposition overseas, and he returns uh, two weeks or so before the actual fall of the regime in Baghdad. And, uh, and he is attempting to reach the Grand Ayatollah, the Sistani, who's still alive and who's still uh, uh, a very powerful uh, voice of moderation, by the way, in Iraq. Um, but he's blocked from doing so by another son of the Grand Ayatollah. And, the, and, 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 and one of the sort of remarkable sort of moments, which is uh, quite, uh, you, you'd think it was, it was scripted for a terrible movie, but it, 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 in fact, it, it was actually what happened. On the very same day that the tyrant falls in Baghdad, the one son of the Grand Ayatollah who stayed behind, who never left Iraq, murders the other son of the Grand Ayatollah, who is returning, who is part of the opposition, who is supporting the war, who is part of the uh, enterprise to construct a new leadership in Iraq. And where does he do this? In the holiest city of Shiism, namely Najaf, and in the holiest site of the city of Najaf, within that city, the tomb of the Imam Ali, the patron saint of Shiism, who, who was murdered in the 7th century. So the series of coincidences uh, are quite remarkable. Now, the but so that story is told in the middle part of the book at great length, and and the narrators on a the, the main narrator, the very same person who was attending the uh, hanging in the first place, uh, is is on a quest to find out who murdered Sayyid Najib because it's not immediately obvious. He is blocked all along the way by the fact that the new elite, uh, empowered by American tanks. Is, is has essentially constructed an enormous cover-up over this murder. So the real story of the of the plot is the cover-up and and his attempts to pierce the cover-up until finally he, he finds out uh, who the murdering agent is. Now I'm working here on a terrain, a factual terrain, and that is all of these things happened. But I'm, I'm I use fiction because I'm going into people's feelings, the ideas that are floating around, the characters of people. At moments of great change, individuals play inordinately important roles in politics. That's a great uh, overview of the book. We're going to be right back. We're going to talk uh, about what Iraq is like now, 10 years after the setting of this novel. And stay with us. And we're back with Kanan Makia, he has a new book out called The Rope, a novel about the situation in Iraq right after 
the Americans uh, went in in 2003 in that in that era. Let me uh, get one one final thing uh, related to this directly. You t- you've mentioned twice now about this leadership void. There wasn't a Mandela. Uh, you talk about Shiites in the book. Uh, they're known as great artists and poets, but not leaders and statesmen. D- did you mean that um, uh, uh, sort of not completely non-fictionally? And is there is there a Mandela there somewhere? Well, you know, Mandelas are are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what can you say? They're not. They don't grow on trees. You know, <laughs> they uh, they are very rare occurrences in history. Uh, at the current moment, no. They're, the current prime minister is the first decent uh, uh, prime minister the country has since the uh, since the 2003 war. Um, but he is the problem is he's surrounded by sharks. Uh, people behold him nowadays to Iran. Iran's influence in Iraq, as you probably know, has grown enormously uh, to the great detriment of the country and the, makes it even harder to uh, pull the country together. But uh, but he is, for the first time, we have uh, at least a non-corrupt, a decent politician doing his best with uh, circling with sharks circling him on, on all sides. Um, you talk about one sort of misperception of the U.S. was the Bath Party of the 1980s, the Republic of Fear that you your bestseller is about, mm-hmm. really doesn't reflect the situation in 2003. Is Saddam's and his infrastructure was more of a shell. That's true. I mean, the state I describe in Republic of Fear, which is a, a, a book largely about the 1970s and 80s, uh, because it appeared in 1989, um, is gone. was gone pretty shortly uh, after the first Gulf War, the 1991 Gulf War. And to remember, that war essentially created a safe haven area in the north of Iraq. The Kurds were, for the first time in their life, autonomous. There had been major insurrections. Hundreds of thousands of people killed, and mass graves are still being opened up in the south, of Shiites in the south and of Kurds in the north. But the the world uh, reacted and protected the Kurds by creating the safe haven area, but he couldn't do anything about the Shiites, and so they continued to languish. Then, of course, there were incredibly uh, tough sanctions, I think the toughest any country has seen since World War II, that were strapped onto the country, and and uh, the 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 totalitarian regime that I describe in Republic of Fear essentially turned into a criminal regime, which was uh, entering the black market, and uh, corruption was becoming rife, and uh, and uh, and the middle class was wiped out between 1991 and 2003. That that 10 year 12 year period. The Iraqi middle class that, that would have been the basis of a democratic transition in Iraq was essentially decimated. And I use the word, you know, guardedly. I don't mean it's just as hyperbole. They were wiped out. I mean, professors selling, standing on, on, on sidewalks, selling their books, uh, universities essentially dismantled, uh, teachers being unable to live on their wages and having to sell exam questions, uh, health professionals working three or four jobs and, uh, and getting medicines on the black market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wow. It was, a, it was devastating. Now, it, so it, this... Um, and the state that previously had been essentially uh, in control of everything, uh, and, and, and with its fable secret polices, uh, various uh, multiple layers of policing agencies, was also uh, uh, reduced, uh, reduced to essentially um, uh, managing this black market economy. So the sanctions had the had the positive effect of you know, making it impossible for Saddam's Iraq to launch another war, which was their prime purpose. So he could no longer build the ability, uh, of, you know, to launch an army abroad. In fact, his army became a fraction of its former size. Uh, but but it did not, ch- uh, it changed, it, it made it more able to oppress its own citizens because it turns out sanctions has that odd, uh, oddly contradictory character. It, it, the balance of power within the country shifted to the regime, and the pain of the sanctions was distributed unevenly, uh, and the population ends up suffering the most. And as we all know from the history of revolutions and uprisings against dictatorship of any kind, the, the last uh, the, the people never can never rise up against a dictator when they're virtually when they're on their knees and they're starving and they're standing in bread queues all the time. They, they, they begin to revolt when their conditions are slightly improving. That's a kind of an old historical truism. And so Iraq was a country, you know, kind of, stra- you know, basically 
cut to, to its knees by sanctions, but the regime was intact. And when that state, when 2003 came along, you know, we talk about it as a war, the war of 2003. Well, it really wasn't a war in the sense that 1991 was a war or the Iraq-Iran war was a war or any of the Arab-Israeli wars that we know about are wars. There was no fighting to speak of. The army just collapsed like a house of cards. It's as though it's as though you had a house of cards and you just pull the rug from under it and the whole thing comes crashing down. It's like a sheet of glass. It didn't just fracture along pieces and the bit of it that was the top ruling elite fell. No, the, the sheet of glass shattered into a thousand pieces. Uh, and that, in part, was because of the rot that had accumulated in, during those sanctions and essentially because of the dictatorship that had lasted for so long. And it turns out that much of the Arab world's uh, problems are, were, you know, where they were foreshadowed by what happened in Iraq in 2003. But it turns out many of these Arab dictatorships are like that. And so the problems that eventually lead to the rise of you know, organizations like al-Qaeda or ISIS long precede the actual war. You can't lay the blame for uh, ISIS on 2003 or on the Arab Spring. or on, you, have, you, have to, you have to lay it on. Something much deeper has been going wrong in this part of the world uh, for at least 30 years, I think. Uh, but that's a whole other subject. Interesting. You talk about uh, what you call the disgraceful way the Iraqis treated the U.S. Now, Vice President Cheney famously said we were going to be greeted as liberators, and I guess the, folk, the people saw us more as occupiers. You put blame on them for, for not treating us as well as we should have been treated? Well, in the beginning, in the very first flush of the 2003 war, the very, very large numbers of people of all walks of life, Sunnis and Shiites, especially Kurds, you know, welcomed the United yeah. States. But it quickly turned uh, sour, so to speak. And, uh, and in part, the blunders of the uh, early months of the occupation, the kind of uh, ignorance of Iraqi habits and cultures, very little preparation had gone into the aftermath of that war. This is, I mean, this has been pointed out in one book after another, and it's true. But, but you can't speak of Iraqis in one voice. I mean, as I as I mentioned earlier, the whole point of the book. I mean, the United States never came to be an occupier in the real sense of the French colonized Algeria or the British colonized India. No, everyone knew, uh, especially the uh, Iraqis, uh, Iraqi Americans like myself, or the, the kind of people coming in from the outside, or the Iraqi opposition and the politicians who uh, were, uh, began to arise after 2000. Everyone knew that the United States was in there for a very, very short time. The only question was, how short? Uh, when would they go? Was it five years? Was it one year? Where, would there be an occupation government, which is what the CPA was? Or would they right away be an, American le- uh, an Iraqi leadership that was essentially appointed by the Americans uh, so that there would be no break of sovereignty from, you know, between before 2003 and after it. These were important questions at the time. And uh, they w- it's not like they were sorted out in, an, in a planned way. Uh, the United States were essentially sort of figuring it out as it went along. Um, the idea of an occupation government only came in two- early in 2003 itself, just before the war. Uh, when the United States lost confidence in the opposition. And the planning for the day after, really, I know, I happen to know for a fact that Jay Garner, who was General Jay Garner, who was entrusted with that task of, you know, providing the electricity and the medications and the food, et cetera, supplies of the country, just, you know, just uh, coming out of uh, a major, you know, uh, the equivalent of a war or change of regime needed, uh, hadn't even an office to work in, uh, you know, in January of 2003. So preparation was was hardly the main thing. Uh, the State Department was consistently against any kind of war. Uh, and then was essentially uh, armed, had its arm twisted to go along with it. The Pentagon really wanted a war, but it never wanted an occupation. And the State Department said that there's going to be a war, then there has to be an occupation because you know, the country is going to fall apart and we have to put it back together again. We, great, we, uh, we, great, we will... great, uh, really a great uh, book and a great overview of the situation. Uh, just a couple of seconds, have we, uh, uh, because we've got to complete, have we handed Iraq to Iran? It is uh, 
a little bit looking like that, but I don't think it's a done deal. It's not finished, and it might very well uh, change, and Iraqis are already reacting against it. And uh, if if it does end up uh, going much deeper, Iran may deeply regret uh, the fact that it has it has become so embroiled in Iraq. But right now, it looks that way. Thanks to Kanan Makia, giving us great perspective from both the Iraqi Shiite side and of course, the American side, and that book, which is mesmerizing. Again, I read it in one sitting, The Rope, a novel published by Pantheon Books. Thanks again to Kanan, and we'll be back with our last national segment. We're going to look at the political crisis in America. And now we're honored to have with us Ron Ricardo. We're going to talk what's wrong with our political system and how we can fix it. Ron Ricardo is founder and managing partner of the Catalyst Consulting Group, a management consulting firm that delivers strategy, performance improvement, and change management. Prior to that, he was a practice leader for Arthur Anderson, uh, where he helped build their change management practice. And it's his experience consulting with over 100 companies gives him good uh, insight, maybe unique insight, into the interplay of the economy, government policy, and regulation, and the political process, which gets us to where we want to go tonight. And something big time is wrong with our political system, dysfunctional gridlock. Donald Trump uh, is come from nowhere. Trump claims his politicians, all they do now is raise money and get reelected. What's wrong with our system first, Ron? Unintentionally, there's been a number of people who have made politics a career as opposed to service. And because there's not mandatory term limits on all of the elected roles, you have many, in many cases, people who have been co-opted. In order to keep getting reelected, you know, they have advocated points of view that may not always be in the best interest of the country or have not balanced their local constituency with a national constituency. You know, a prime example would be, uh, think of the U.S. Postal Service. If you ask 10 people on the street, probably all 10 would say it's in a state of disarray, yet any time there's discussions about closing one of the uh, locations and it tends to get tabled and tabled and tabled and nothing happens. I think another issue is, you know, over the years, I have found that the political parties seem to work less and less effectively together. You know, it's kind of funny. You listen to the State of the Union, and let's say, say, for example, the Democrats are in power, and everything the president says, they clap at. And conversely, the Republicans sit there with a blank look on their face like they're wind-up toy robots. You know, the reality is whether you're a Democrat or a Republican, if you're open-minded, you know, you have to see that each party in their platform has some things that could be appealing, even if you're on the other side. You know, example, uh, the Democrats are pro-abortion. You know, the Republicans are pro-life. Democrats uh, don't want to privatize Social Security. The Republicans think the younger workers should have a personal investment option. They have to work better together, number one. And then number two, I think you have to get a little bit more objectivity so that people can see the perspective of others as opposed to just kind of genuflecting and following the party line. You think there needs to be less ideology then, uh, less sort of on the wings? Uh, Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think that's a great idea uh, and a great point you're making. I think also, you know, that part of the challenge is I believe the parties exert way too much influence on the candidates. If you are not in line with the party line, you get beaten up. So you, in a sense, have to tote the party line unless you're a Donald Trump and you have your own war chest. And that's a good point, to uh, war chest. Bernie Sanders is, is big on campaign finance reform. Um, wh- where are you on that? There's not much I agree with Bernie about, <laughs> but I must tell you, I mean, think about what was the last president that we elected who was quote-unquote poor? Maybe Truman? You know, it's a long way ago, you know, and I think what you have now is, you know, it would be really great if we could do it is if instead of just having uh, laws that restrict contributions, you know, uh, to a PAC or an individual, wouldn't it be nice if we had a total contribution limit? So then you wouldn't need to have a war chest to get yourself elected, and then you back in. If the answer is it's, you know, $10 million, and you have to work with $10 million, and everyone has to work with $10 million. Why do you think Donald Trump is being so successful? Is this an indictment of the Republican Party um, uh, or the whole political system? Donald Trump represents a a no vote. People are very frustrated with the gridlock. I think people are very frustrated with people who don't honor commitments, will say anything to get elected. Uh, He represents a person 
who can get things done. He represents a person who has managed a large business. And I think he represents somebody who has a whole different set of skills. Uh, and I think in some cases that's really um, enticing to people who feel disenfranchised. It's interesting. He does have he has great branding skills. He's almost intimidated at everybody else the way he just labels say Jeb Bush low energy. Next thing you know, Jeb Bush is is basically finished. Do you think that um, that that we do we need that kind of a revolution? Whether it's Bernie Sanders, um, you know, uh, uh, blowing up campaign finance, saying we need to have free colleges, uh, minimum wage up, or Trump on the other side uh, blowing up even the Republican establishment. Do we need that? Well, I think, you know, each person, you know, again, back to my point, I think if you listen to Bernie, if you listen to uh, Trump on the other side of the continuum, each of them has some really good points if you're open-minded. You know, Mm -hmm. let's pick the example about the minimum wage. I do not believe the government's role is to artificially create a minimum standard of living. When somebody says we're going to say it's a $15 minimum hourly rate, you know, ask yourself the questions. Is flipping hamburgers at McDonald's, really worth $15 an hour. If you're looking at it from a free market standpoint, you'd probably say no. So then why are we doing it? Well, we're trying to help people who are disadvantaged. I feel for those people because I grew up with with the parents who had very limited resources. But conversely, you know, I would argue they're where they are because they haven't made some very good choices in life. Maybe perhaps they haven't availed themselves to be educated. So their skill sets are at X amount. To me, the real problem is our educational system. You know, let me give you an example. My cousin was a 30-year teacher in public school. No child left behind. He had people who had learning disabilities that were in his chemistry class, which was a college prep class. And he was told, don't flunk these people. Now, you know, look, I don't think they should be you know, put in a room and locked away. Of course not. But I don't think it's also fair to put them in a, a highly competitive, very complex, highly analytical, if, God forbid, they have some limitations, you know, intellectually. I think it's you, you made good points in really trying to bring more rational uh, discourse to a, uh, a, a dysfunctional process right now. Uh, just in a couple of seconds, are you optimistic about uh, the change that may come out of this or not? I really think that, uh, in my opinion, we've tilted towards socialism. And I really don't believe that Trump can win a national election. Uh, in some cases, it's his own fault. He said some things that I think have alienated groups of people that he's going to need. Uh, I do think that win or lose, somebody like him has gotten people to think a different mousetrap. You know, he's, he's, he's very direct, even with the media. I mean, he doesn't back down like a typical politician. He certainly changed the rules. We've been talking with Ron Ricardo, founder and managing partner again of the Catalyst Consulting Group. And, Ron, just to finish up, uh, how can uh, anybody uh, contact you if they'd like to learn more about your services? Number uh, is 860-518-3583, or they can go to our website, catalystconsultinggroup.org. And how about an email? Uh, rricardo at catalystconsultinggroup.org. Okay, quite an impressive track record you've had between Arthur Anderson and your own business, so uh, I hope folks take you up on that offer. Thank you so much. You're listening to Business Talk with Jim Campbell. This is Segment 5 Overtime, exclusively for Yale Radio, WYBC. Thanks, Dama, for staying with us. And uh, just to get back to where we ended, um, you ended up spending 10 years there. You went as a complete idealist, hoping to rebuild the rack. Uh, as you look back, was it worth it for you? This is a question that you know I've been struggling with since I left Iraq. I mean, I actually left in 2010 with General Odierno, but I kept going back. So I, I go back and I visit my Iraqi friends, and I kept going back to see how the country is doing. And I struggled to come to terms with what all the sacrifice and the effort had been for. And this is what led me to write the book. I had witnessed so many events, I felt that... I've got a duty to record them. I believe that we honor the lives that were lost by trying to learn the right lessons from this war. And I wanted to acknowledge the huge efforts of the soldiers, of those who tried to give Iraq a better hope 
better chance for a better future. And I really wanted to pay tribute to Iraq because it's a country that I came very much to love. So personally, I look back at this time and think, you know, I met amazing people. I met amazing Americans. I met amazing Iraqis. So I can never regret that. Help us understand, uh, as Americans, we, we look at this and we say, we gave so much of our of blood and treasure to this country, and they never really seemed to appreciate us. It's true. I mean, a lot of Iraqis will blame us for everything that went wrong. They're very good at blaming others. They're not so good at looking at themselves hmm. and being more self-critical. But you can see, you know, the Kurds in the north, they're doing well, that their area is thriving. And in parts of the south, those towns in the south are also prospering. So we have to hope, you know, when you look today, Iraq looks quite grim. But in 10 years, in 20 years, we have to hope that it looks a lot better. Uh, tell people, because I'm sure they'll be interested, what Colonel May, uh, Mayville and General O are doing right now. General Odiano is chief of staff of the army. And so he's the guy responsible for basically running the whole of the U.S. Army. So he's the top army general. And Colonel Mavel is now Lieutenant General Mavel. And he works in the Pentagon. He works very closely with the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Um, what feedback have you gotten from them and the military on your book? Obviously, you go, you go, you're pretty inside stuff. Revealed. The feedback has been really, really interesting. I mean, I receive emails and letters from all over the states. The most common refrain is from soldiers thanking me for honoring their efforts. And I get, you know, these long emails that explain what area a particular soldier had been working in, the relationships he built up with the Iraqis he'd been with, and what he'd seen. So many of them say, you know, even though it's all gone badly wrong, that they did try very hard. I've had some emails from Vietnam vets who see similarities with the situation that they had found themselves in. By the way, talking of similarities, and let's get back to that for a sec. Um, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Vietnam. Do We don't seem to uh, learn from our mistakes, do we? It seems sort of we're destined to repeat ourselves. Our, uh, our mistakes, and, and also, it, it, I st if you step back and you look at Vietnam, Afghanistan, and Iraq, um, these are not major countries or big countries or power centers, and we get involved in them as the most powerful country and don't seem to be able to win anything. There are some, you can see certain repetitions that happen, certain cultural characteristics about this naive optimism, so always thinking that everything is possible, everything is possible. And it takes quite a time to be able to actually see reality, that things are not going so well. I think in Iraq and Afghanistan, we really tried to do too much. We think we can recreate these societies in our image. And often we lose sight of what's the critical path, the most important thing, and that is the political agreement between the elites. And that needs to be brokered, because otherwise everything that we do can have no impact at all. You can see the masses of time and money we put into training the Iraqi army. And that army collapsed last summer in the face of the Islamic State. They outnumbered the Islamic State 100 to 1. Yeah. But they collapsed because they didn't have the right leadership. They didn't have morale. I mean, the good officers that we had trained, Maliki had removed and replaced them by his own cronies who were then corrupt and oh. weren't giving the troops money and they weren't giving the troops ammunition. And so never told the Iraqi army to fight ISIS. And so it's not just about train and equip. You really need to have the politics in place, the leadership in place, to make these things work. Just, uh, it's just hard to comprehend some mistakes. Um, General Petraeus, um, how, how do you come down on, on him? He seems like such an outstanding uh, leader in general, uh, but yet a lot of, the, of his compatriots didn't like him there, I mean, even you even say in the book that General O had a rivalry with him. General Petraeus was, you know, the brightest and best general of his generation. And 
you know, intellectually, he is amazing. There were, of course, jealousies and rivalries because he's a very competitive man. He always has to be better than others. And so that caused, you know, some rivalries. So you can see at the beginning of my book when they're division commanders, they're rivals. But when General Petraeus becomes General Odiano's boss, they actually get on very well. And that works well together. Military guys do respond to rank very well. How about um, in getting back to how important it is to have the right person there? Uh, you said uh, at one point Hillary Clinton put a new ambassador into Iraq, Chris Hill, who ended up doing a lot of damage. Yes, I mean, individuals really do matter. So you can think of General Petraeus and General Odiano. Those were superb leaders, superb military leaders that really made a difference in Iraq. And on the civilian side, we had Ambassador Crocker for a period, and he was superb and had a great relationship working with the military. Ambassador Crocker had got years of, years of experience of working in the Middle East. He spoke Arabic. He had a real affinity for the people and was a wonderful mediator. Unfortunately, Ambassador Hill didn't have any regional experience, didn't speak the language, didn't want to be there and didn't have any affinity for the Iraqis hmm. and didn't work well with the U.S. military. So completely the wrong appointment. On Petraeus, um, uh, the father of the counterinsurgency manual that had been rewritten uh, out in Kansas, I think, when he was uh, there for an assignment, um, has nation building um, been deemed uh, overall a, a, a basic a failed policy and counterinsurgency is gone? I think the downfall of Petraeus has dealt a big blow to counterinsurgency. But it's also important to see counterinsurgency in its context. After the complete mistakes and those total mistakes made in the early years in Iraq, we had dug ourselves into a massive hole. It was counterinsurgency that helped us dig ourselves out of that hole. So it's not like, yes, this is what we must go and do everywhere. You hope to never get into a situation where you need to apply counterinsurgency tactics. But that is what's happened. I think at the moment, things, you know, people say, oh, counterinsurgency doesn't work. We must go back to conventional. Well, you know, we don't get to choose the sorts of wars always that we'd like to find ourselves in. Yeah. And so these small types of wars, these small types of insurgencies are all over the place and we mustn't throw the baby out with the bath water because a lot of these tactics do work but we mustn't lose sight with if we don't have an overall strategy to which these tactics are supposed to contribute then tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat the um in counterinsurgency ultimately success requires if you look at the ones that were successful like over 10 years um, so if we had a longer time frame, um, might, for instance, the Arab Spring uh, and e moving to more uh, democratic, less authoritarian, less corrupt regimes in the Middle East be a reality? Or is that a, a, a dream, you know, a naive uh, assumption as well? I think we live in a different era these days. You know, America's ne never set out to be a colonial power. We live in a different era. We live in the information era. And people have more information much more quickly, more knowledge much more quickly. In America, there's no domestic consensus on what American foreign policy should be. There's not consensus domestic in the role of America in the world. And so every administration will come in and it, it will do what it does for a couple of years, and then another administration comes in and does something differently. So this means that America doesn't appear to be a reliable ally mm -hmm. to other countries. So it is, it is difficult. So it's not just about longevity, but longevity of relationship is important. Understanding a role in the world is important. Trying to maintain more balance in the Middle East is important, so it doesn't look as if Iran is the big winner out of this war. I want to, how do you think Arab Spring will play out? And with that, do you, you were just saying the U.S. needs to provide um, a stable commitment or uh, leadership. 
And the big criticism is President Obama's sort of withdrawn or detached himself from the Middle East. When you look at, you know, revolutions that have taken place before, these things go through a, a very long, long process. The Middle East is changing, and there was great hope in the early days of the Arab Spring that this change was going to be quick, and it would end in liberal democracy. Now, these changes are still taking place. You've had the counter-revolution, and authoritarian regimes are becoming stronger again. But it is going to take a long time. Democracy doesn't have the image that it once had at the end of the Cold War, when it seemed that you know, liberal democracy was the only way to go. Now China is rising. There are different models. In the Middle East, people often look towards a country such as Dubai as a good model, where there you have economically you know, a prosperous country, socially conservative. People are religious. And so people see... People, you know, politics in the Middle East often has a bad name. Political parties are seen to be corrupt. People want transparent and clean government. So I think it's going to take a long time. The question is, obviously, can we influence it and in which way? If we just end up sending lots of weapons to authoritarian leaders so they can crush their domestic opposition, that doesn't help bring about that transformation in those societies. All right, let's talk about Afghanistan a little bit. People call that or President Obama's war, decision to his war of choice. And I never understood how counterinsurgency could work in a country where there was no strong central government. Um, you had Taliban, uh, drug warlords, pover- extreme poverty, al-Qaeda. Um, what's the definition of success in Afghanistan, and what, what should have happened there? Well, in Afghanistan, again, we sort of chose good guys, bad guys. And the problem with the way that counterinsurgency is framed is it assumes that there's a legitimate state and that people who oppose it are not legitimate. And in both Iraq and Afghanistan, the regimes, the legitimacy of the regimes was disputed. And by bigging up, if you like, the regime, we can make the regime less likely to do a deal with those who are opposing it. And so sometimes what we have done is not bring people closer together, it's actually brought them further apart and sowed the seed for more conflict. To bring stability to Afghanistan, there has to be some sort of power-sharing compromise between the different groups, including the Taliban. So there will be some Taliban that can be brought into the political process. Other Taliban won't be able to, but there will be some that can be brought in. So stability, like in Iraq, does require this political deal. Are you optimistic that that can happen at some point, that Afghanistan stabilizes itself? I don't follow Afghanistan as closely as I follow Iraq. Mm -hmm. There are potentials for coming to some stability there, but often it requires agreements between the neighboring countries. So you can look at those other countries outside Afghanistan that have got an interest in Afghanistan. Pakistan. Pakistan, Iran, U.S., different countries that have a big interest inside Afghanistan. So how can you sort of help build up Afghanistan rather than make it a battlefield between all these other competing countries? One thing that's always bothered me is that, um, you know, know, we'll come in and we'll throw money at different sides and we'll get them to switch sides. For all, you've talked about the Sunnis even switching sides when when Al-Qaeda, when they saw that Al-Qaeda was going to take the country down. We fought on the same side as Osama bin Laden in Afghanistan when they were against the Soviets. It seems to me that it's always going to be totally futile because um, there's there's no consistency in who's aligned with who. And people will change within months. It's sort of like, uh, it just keeps striking me as fool's goal to try to, you know, try and, and, and win something. Well, this goes back to the, you know, longevity of relationships. Mm-hmm. And a lot of these groups, they are self-interested. And so nothing is written in stone. People can change their allegiances, can change their alliances. So it's having some sort of optimistic future. You can try and take these countries towards I mean, going back to Iraq, Iraq has got oil and water. It's got amazing human capital. So the potential there is huge. Afghanistan is not blessed 
to the same degree as Iraq. Do you think that, uh, I look at the three of the greatest generals of our um, generation, Petraeus, McChrystal, and General Mattis, who was uh, in the Marines, all out of the military, um, some self-inflicted wounds there. But um, w- does that say something badly about our political leadership or, or why, why the most creative and innovative and successful generals are out? Um, I'm not, I don't think so. When you think that you know, Petraeus and Mattis got to four stars before they retired and Petraeus went on to the CIA, McChrystal was the one whose career was cut short, but he'd already gone right the way through to three stars. So there are some very, very fine American generals. But at the end of the day, wars, and people say, you know, strategy is far too important to be left to generals. Mm -hmm. Wars, how wars start and how wars end, that has to be led by our political leaders, our civilian leaders. And the military can give their best military advice. But at the end of the day, the military is one tool of national power. It's one instrument of national power. And so diplomacy, reaching deals, is what all that military power should be used towards, trying to push towards the end of war, a political agreement of some sort. Now, the British uh, obviously basically ran the world for a, a long time and then overextended and shrunk back. Are we sort of following that arc in the U.S.? Um, The rise and fall of empires. But America's never set out, never seen itself in that same way. It's never seen itself as an imperial power, a colonial power. America still has a very strong economy. So America's capacity is still there. What is different at the moment is America's will to use that capacity. America still is the greatest country in the world. And it's whether, I think, you know, after the Bush and the neoconservatives, which was about, you know, intervene everywhere, change the world, Mm -hmm. it was inevitable that the pendulum was going to swing way, way, way back to the, you know, 180 degrees with the next president. Interesting. But I think whoever comes next, you'll see the pendulum go somewhere back towards the middle again. Interesting. Um, One of the things, I mean, you were able to say whatever you wanted uh, to Colonel Mayville, to the generals, and um, does the military political correctness and and the, you know, the uh, um, line of uh, order and everything, does it inhibit somewhat the communications of of, of telling truth to power to these guys? Uh, And and that was sort of an advantage you have? Or is the flow of honest information out there on on the battle scenes um, coming right through? I, mean, I think it says an awful lot about the U.S. military that they would hire somebody like me to work with them. I mean, you think of General Odiano, a three-star, then a four-star general, has got a female civilian foreigner as his political advisor. That's a very, very different voice. And so I think that says a lot about them, that they feel open to having such a different voice inform and influence them. I have found them very focused on achieving the mission, whatever the mission is that they are given. They want to do it to the best of their capability, and they will bring in whatever resources that they can to do it. I've also seen in, you know, private conversations behind closed doors that the generals do speak truth to their civilian masters. Interesting. Do um, General O... Do you get a sense of what the difference is uh, in terms of uh, just his passion uh, and sense of mission when he's running a, a battlefield theater versus now he's in more of a, uh, I don't know what we use the word, bureaucratic job uh, running the Army? It's obviously a very different experience to be based in the U.S. out of the Pentagon. When you're a commanding general at war, you feel that you have not only the responsibility but the authority to make things happen. And so there, when he says, you know, turn to the left, everybody turns to the left, or turn to the right, everybody turns to the right. And so I think, you know, if you ask generals, they would much rather be commanding out in the field than being in the Pentagon. I've never met anybody who's really, you know, (laughs) been enthusiastic about having to work in the Pentagon. (laughs) 
All right. Now, as we end up here, you're you're sort of in an after action mode at Yale, a chance to think, and you've written this uh, great book. What are you going to do next? Well, <laughs> I've been thinking of just you know how to bring closure almost to my time in Iraq. You're going to go back. You're going to go back <laughs> <laughs> by trying to learn the right lessons. You've mentioned that you know we see this repetition of the same mistakes. And I believe that, you know, investing in the next generation, teaching, writing is a way of trying to ensure that we really genuinely do learn so we don't keep repeating those mistakes. So for the future, for, you know, for my immediate future, I'm still based at Yale. I'm very much enjoying teaching here. And, you know, it's a good spot to be in. And I have to say that I've, I've been privileged to interview a lot of these folks that uh, ran the war, and regardless of how successful or unsuccessful it was, these, these, these people are incredibly expe- uh, impressive um, leaders, uh, as you said before, with great educational backgrounds now, and they're very good people. So it's, yeah. um, it's, a, it's a great thing. And obviously, uh, we thank you for your service for our country. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> you very probably much. did a... <laughs> Yeah, it's Emma Sky, the book again, The Unraveling High Hopes and Missed Opportunities in Iraq. Thanks to Emma Sky. Thanks to our loyal Yale radio audience for staying with us. See you next Sunday on Business Talk with Jim Campbell.